Welcome back to episode two of the Jundum Heroes. I'm your host, Alex. So last episode, we covered Frank Scofield and his influence on Korean history. He was an individual with righteousness to the Korean people and bringing awareness of happenings to the whole world. This time around, we will be discussing two Americans and their life dedicated to Korea's development. So before we continue, I will introduce our guests right away. Let's welcome Tin from Hong Kong. Hi. So Tin, uh, give us a little bit more about yourself, a self-introduction about you know, why you're in Korea and maybe currently what you're up to. Sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Tin and I'm from Hong Kong. I've been in Korea for almost two and a half years and I've just graduated from the graduate school where I mainly studied Korean history and Korean missionary history. So uh, I've graduated, so I'm going back home after one week. So I'm so happy and lucky to be here today. <laughs> yeah, we're more lucky because we caught you before you're going back home. <laughs> and actually, um, you're probably the perfect guest for today's episode to talk about Underwood and Evan Zeller as you have a genuine interest in missionaries. So to get started a little bit, um, you know, we're talking about these two gentlemen. Uh, where have you heard these people before, or it, where in depth have you studied these two people? Yeah, Underwood and Appenzella, they're both really important people, important characters, figures in Korean history. Uh, even though the mainstream historian may not always mention them, mm -hmm. they are indeed really important because they bring in Western civilization, Western culture to Korea, which is chosen at that time. Mm -hmm. So they contributed a lot to the Medical, medical, educational development in Chosun at that time. So actually, personally, I've heard Underwood a few times when I was taking Korean classes at your graduate school, Univer Yonsei University, and you see his name a lot on campus. So there's actually a statue of Underwood along with, I believe, a building named after him and even greatly a whole college named Underwood College at Yonsei University. So, you know, why is he so famous at Yonsei, let alone the whole of Korea? And similarly with Eppin Zeller, you know, they both came to Korea as missionaries. So we'll dig a bit deeper into their upbringing and their journey to coming to Korea. So on to the first part, um, in the process to Korea, let's start with a little bit of their background. Can we start with Underwood? Sure, talking about Underwood, he actually born in London at uh, when he was small and then he immigrated to the US day, USA at 13. He later graduated at the New York University and the New Brunswick Theological Seminary in 1881. He was then ordained to be a Dutch Reformed Ministry and began studying medicine to, became, uh, to become a more complete missionary to India um, because he has been wanting to become an Indian missionary since he was really young. But then when he was studying in the seminary, Korea was finally opened up to the West. So uh, the, the, the states finally started to send missionary to, to, to Korea. And then it was then uh, Underwood decided to change his um, mission field destination to Korea instead of India. Oh, wow. So he had his, uh, he had his whole setup for India, but then all of a sudden, because <laughs> certain circumstance, he changed to Korea. I see. So then how about um, Eppenzeller? For Appenzella, very interestingly, he was on the same boat when Underwood came to Korea, so they came together. His story starts with being born in 1855 to, as a fourth generation Pennsylvania Dutch parents. He entered Westchester Normal School in Westchester, but then after experiencing a spiritual conversion, he enrolled in Franklin and Marshall College in Lancaster to prepare for the German Reformed Ministry. Then he became an assistant pastor in the Methodist Episcopal Church in 1880. Um, upon graduating, he enrolled in the Drew the Theological Seminary in New Jersey. Then he started to show his interest in foreign mission at that time. He requested to be a missionary in Japan, but there, there was no available um, position at that time. So later, when Korea was open as a mission field, he and his wife Ella was sent to Korea. That's how he came to Korea at the end. So actually, they're, even though they, they're both, right, Eppin Zeller and Underwood, they had a different country in mind before actually coming to Korea. And I wanted to ask you, Tin, personally, you know, uh, kind of similar to them, did you have any experience with um, having like a set, 
path, but then changing it for whatever reason, uh, whether coming to history or just in another subject in your life? Yeah, just like the missionary, actually, I didn't plan to come to Korea at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Even four years ago, I was still a person who, who knew nothing about Korea, not even K-pop, K-drama, I knew nothing. Mm -hmm. So at that time, I, I was planning to go on an exchange program and I wanted to go to Netherlands because I wanted to go to um, European countries. But then for Asian students, um, they all like to go to European countries as um, exchange destination. So then it's really competitive and I was not that competitive because my GPA was not that high. So then I turned out to come to Korea at the end. But then it's after coming to Korea, I started to learn about um, Korean language, Korean history, and I visited museums around Seoul. And then I realized my interest in Korean Korean history. So that's why I came back again to study for the master degrees mm -hmm. later. So looking back, I feel really lucky and thankful to be an exchange student in Korea instead of Netherlands. Yeah, I think your story is very relatable to right. anyone that is listening or watching this. And I think um, we just kind of have to like, if kind of life puts us in one path, like, you know, it doesn't mean getting rejected from Netherlands means the end, right? right? And for as well as for Underwood and Eppenzeller, you know, they couldn't go to their dream country to be a missionary. But in the end, they, there was a lot of things that they contributed mm. to. So moving on and forward with uh, Underwood and Eppenzeller, they, as you said, both came on the same boat and probably on one of the very first boats and only boats from the Western country into Incheon, Korea on Easter Sunday, April 5th. 1885. You know, how did their life get started in Korea? Yeah, for Underwood, he first started to teach physics and chemistry at Sejong Won. He went on to establish an orphanage called the Kuse School in 1886. And then the next year, he founded the first Korea first uh, organized church, which is the Simunan Presbyterian Church. Later, he also established the uh, John D. Wells Academy for Christian Workers and also changed his name to Kyongsin School in 1905. Mm -hmm. And then in 1915, he founded Kyongsin College, which later became Yonhee College, and that is today's um, Yonsei University. Oh, wow. So even from the beginning, he did all of these educational institute accomplishments. Um, and how about Eppenzeller? For Eppenzella, during that time, Seoul was in a very complicated political situation, so missionary could not really preach in public, and also they could not set up school, uh, church, sorry, I mean yeah. church, because at that time, Gojong really hates Christianity. Even though he allowed missionary to come to Korea, he doesn't allow them to preach. Mm -hmm. So for the first two years, he also um, only focused on preparing missionary residents in the first two years. So he also get himself prepared. He studied Korean for five hours a day and then tried to pre preach the gospel in Korean. And then he also found a boys' school, which is called Pejahaktan, that we will discuss later. And then Pejahaktan, the name actually was given by Kojong, and it means a whole for reading uh, of useful men in Korea. And he built this school in 1887. And later it becomes the, today's Pejah University too. And he was also one of the founders of the first Korean Methodist church in Seoul, Jongdong. He served there as a pastor in 1887 until his death in 1902. So it seems like they had very similar paths in the, very, in the beginning with missionary goals and then eventually establishing, establishing educational institutes were also similar in that case. Right, they were actually also co-workers and partners, not only in preaching gospel, but like setting up school and also they um, many of these missionaries were the first batch of linguists in, in Korea, in Korean language. So they all worked together to translate the Bible into Korean. At that time, Bible was, uh, was in Chinese characters, so commoners cannot read it because of the low education level. So these missionaries, including Appenzella and also Underwood, they worked together to translate the Bible into Hangul, the, the this more easier Korean um, characters. Mm. So they uh, they worked together and completed the New Testament and the Old Testament by 1910. Yeah, I can't imagine being one of the first to be over there with with no education in the local language and then being able to get used to and eventually, oh, translating the Bible <laughs> is not an easy thing back then, even now still, so it's very impressive. And as you had mentioned, you, and we have mentioned a few times already about first coming over to Korea with missionary work, and then kind of transitioning into developing educational institutes, I can see kind of a pattern with not just them, but, you know, can we dig a little deeper on, you know, what kind of uh, way they did this? 
So for missionaries, not only the Korean missionaries like Epensela or Underwood, or for, but for missionaries around the world, usually when they arrive the mission fields, they usually follow the three, threefold strategy, which means the three folds were Protestantizing, which is preaching gospel, and also medicine, which, is, which means um, providing Western medicine and building hospitals, and also education, which is providing scholarship, providing, I mean, building schools for and providing educational opportunity for the people. So you can always observe hospital, church, and school when you go to any country where there have been missionaries arriving there. So this applies to the case in Korea too. So nowadays in Cheongdong, you can see church, uh, schools and church, schools and hospitals together um, at that time and also now too. And for example, there you can find the Cheongdong First Church built by, um, built by, uh, built by Appen Seller. And also there were also hospital for women at that time. And also there are schools including the Pese Haktang and also the Kuse Haktang built by um, Underwood. Oh wow, so there is that systematically uh, it's a kind of move not just from spreading Christianity or just you know the religion in general but developing into medical as you said and education system yeah talking about education they at that time they always believed that the missionary believed that um, civilization the Christianity can also bring civilization to the Koreans so they don't they didn't only preach the gospel but they also uh, taught the Korean their language and also even practical skills like hygiene to the Koreans I think it's really interesting to hear the background of this uh, kind of lifestyle that the missionaries bring, especially for Underwood and Epin Zeller. Uh, we kind of have a better idea of what their goals in mind were coming to Korea. So to get a little bit more specific on the developments, uh, we'll turn to the next corner, which is the process of establishing Cheongdong's first church. So specifically talking about, and as we were, you know, the first church was established by Eppenzeller. Yeah, the first Protestant church of Korea was established by Eppenzeller and it is the Cheongdong First Methodist Church. Mm -hmm. It is. Uh, it was built in 1897 in Cheongdong. You can still see it today in Cheongdong. So at that time, like what we mentioned before, preaching the gospel was prohibited because of the very complicated political and religious struggles at that time. But it is until 1887, public worship was allowed. So that's why Appenzella started to build the first um, building for surface, which is at that time, which is known as the Bethlehem Chapel. Mm -hmm. And then it is, the currently, it is currently the only 19th century Protestant church in Korea that exists wow. today. And in this 100th anniversary, they even built a new chapel next to the original church. You can still see it today in Cheongdong. I can't imagine how old this church must be that, you know, they probably need to build a newer annex for it. Uh, probably if you continue to go there, it will det deteriorate a little bit. So you need to, you know, restore and keep some historical things from it. So. Yeah, maybe it's also small that when people when there are more congregation when right. it grows then you need more building as well that's true Bigger building. Um, mm. as more people come in mm. they probably would never imagine now right. this old church in this big bustling city of seoul right they still preserve it really well so you know for those out there who are in seoul right maybe because of corona <laughs> you cannot go in there currently but hopefully as it gets better uh but you Right now, you can probably pass by Right, it. you can pass by it. Yeah, Chongo. so if anyone wants to pay a visit, you can see the first uh, better off church in Cheongdong. And to build off on that, taking a step back into history, you know, back then I know that you had mentioned um, worshipping was not allowed. So can we talk a little bit about, you know, how they would practice it or what was kind of going on during that time? Sure, at the beginning, Gojong really hates Christianity. Mm -hmm. So even though he allowed the missionaries to come to Korea, um, he didn't allow them to preach. So they only, so he only wants uh, them to build schools, build hospitals to help the Korean, but no, never preaching the gospel. So at the beginning, there's no church. But then later, even though there's church like the uh, Cheongdong First Church that we just mentioned, even though there, there are ch there's, there's start to be ch church in Korea, they still uh, uphold the very strict gender segregation under the new Confucianism, which is the national philosophy at that time. So under this really strict gender segregation, female and, ma female and male, they, men and women, they cannot 
they should not see each other or even touch each, each other. So at that time in the Chengdong First Church, is, there's a very special way of worshipping. It's not like the, the church service that we, we can see nowadays, because men and women need to be separated. The congregation were also separated into men and female, and then in between them, there's a curtain so that they cannot see each other, and they could only listen to the sermon um, preached by the pastor. Yeah, and more interesting thing is that uh, for the baptism at that time, because most of the pastors were male at that time, right. but if there's some female converts, they want to receive baptism. So it is actually really, um, they, they shouldn't be baptized by the male pastor because they shouldn't touch each other. Mm -hmm. So how they, uh, how they uh, perform the baptism is that they also have another curtain, mm -hmm. and then in the, there in, on the curtain, there's a hole for the female to stuck her head up, out uh -huh. of that hole. Okay. So they just received their baptism yeah. through that hole. So the wow. male pastor would um, baptize, baptize her through the hole on the curtain, so to avoid them touching or seeing each other. Yeah, I can't imagine how back in time that would be to have that kind of segregation. You can imagine how old this church is to have those kind of rules put in place. So. It's very far-fetched from what we are currently in 2021. Mm. So um, it's kind of interesting to hear some of that history and how they were going about back then in regards to worshiping and uh, how they were kind of practicing that. I'm glad that we were able to talk about uh, Chengdong uh, First Providence Church because it's something that we can actually visually see even now. Mm. So that kind of piece of history is very interesting. You can actually see that church and with its history going back to more than 100 years ago. And moving on, let's talk, let's go on to our last corner, which is going to be about Heje Hakdang, or now as we know it as Heje University, which is also a, has deep history within the Chandong area. Mm. I pencilled built uh, the Heje Hakdang in 1885. Uh, at that time, Pejak Tang was located in Seoul, but now Pejak University is not located in Seoul. Mm -hmm. So nowadays, you can still find the Pejak Tang Museum in the Chengdong area. So that was the year that um, that uh, Ko Jung's, uh, the, the next year after he built the school, Ko Jung actually authorized the institute and gave the official approval to the school and also gave the name to the school. And it was also the, until then that Christianity was become, become legalized at that mm -hmm. time. So at that time, they teach English, Korean, Chinese classics, and also theology in the school. And one of those really special features of the school is that the missionaries try to nurture the independent spirits of the students. Mm -hmm. So at that time, many students were too poor that they cannot pay the tuition fee. So what the missionary did is that they built, a, they set up a printing press at the ba basement of the school, which is called the trilingual press there. And then in that printing press, they print, um, they print uh, newspapers, magazines, Christian books, and Bibles there. And then the students were actually the workers of that printing press. Mm -hmm. So that through working there, they could earn their own salary. Mm -hmm. And with the salary, they could pay their tuition fee. So that helps a lot. I think that helps a lot of poor students um, to be able to pay the tu tuition fee and to receive education. I think. Uh Probably, as you said, back then this is a new system, right? Right, I think it's a really new thing to Korean because before, if you have no money, then you, you, you cannot receive education. Right. It and it kind of ends there, right? Right, no and, hope right. but then I think this system, this kind of independent, training up their independent spirit, this kind of system actually helped them um, to build up their, their um, to, to let them to be self-support and also it promotes the social mobility because if you're poor, you still have a chance to get exactly. um, to get to receive education by our own effort. Yeah, and that's kind of our modern day work study, right? To right. be able to work with the school to earn money and your own tuition on your own hands and own time. So obviously it's not easy to work and go to school at the same time, <laughs> but that's the opportunity they gave me. Right. You. So I, I really enjoy talking about onto Peje University, <laughs> which is what it is now, right? So that development is very interesting. And as you had said, the re in relation with Changdong is that it originally developed in Seoul, even though now it is in Tejan, mm, right? right? So it's good to know that, you know, a lot of these uh, missionary uh, missionaries that came in here, uh, 
a lot of the history goes into Jongdong uh, from the very beginning, along with the churches and then education, along with even now, the prestigious universities always started from the bottom, right? Uh, with people that could not afford mm. it, and then building up from only maybe like one or two right. students into one of the most prestigious schools in Korea and in the world. So uh, concluding this episode, I want to say that it was really interesting to talk about these kind of hard facts of history with Tim by my side here. I can really feel your genuine interest in this type of topic. So uh, thank you for your time to join us today on this podcast. Um, You know, how was it for you to talk about this subject? Yeah, I'm so excited (laughs) and I'm so happy to be invited here because there are not many chances that people are interested about uh, missionary history. So this is a really good chance for me to share what I learn Mm -hmm. and what I study. And I'm really happy to be here. Yeah, I think this gives, a, like you said, good chance for viewers and listeners to really understand a little bit more. In this very short amount of time, obviously we can't, you know, give you a quiz or test on all the things, but if you had to take away some of this information and kind of remember it, you know, I think these, imp- at least the people are very important to remember and be uh, kind of signified because uh, they had a huge influence in Korean history. Yeah. So wrapping up for today's episode, I want again to thank you, Tim, and also the viewers and listeners out there for joining us today and to stay tuned for the upcoming Chondong Heroes podcast and our series that discovers all things and different variety topics related to Chondong. So again, we are going to conclude today's episode and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Bye. Bye.